All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. It's so nice to see all of you here at the um, at our Saturday morning virtual tour of We Move and We Stay. I'm Aliyah Vinick. I'm the events manager at the Science Museum of Minnesota. And, oh, I've got a, oh shoot. <laughs> I just got a note from my tech guy that I've, you all are seeing my downloads bar. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Aliyah Vinick. I'm the events manager at the Science Museum of Minnesota. And as you know, this event is part of Member Appreciation Month, our way of saying thank you for your continued support of our mission to make science education accessible to everyone. Before we begin today, I'm going to share a few reminders about Zoom. First of all, we'll be running this program with a few different presenters, and the best way to see them and the slides that they're presenting is by choosing speaker view in the upper right of your Zoom screen. So I'll give you a minute to do that. And I also want to remind you that you're all muted right now, so I'll ask you to keep your microphones off for the duration of the program, though we will have time for a Q&A towards its conclusion. You can use the chat window in the bottom of your screen to share your thoughts and questions. So thanks for your help with that. And now to today's program, uh, we'll be exploring the elements of our We Move and We Stay exhibition, which showcases beautiful and meaningful objects created by Native Americans who live in the place that we call Minnesota today. I'd like to begin with a very short video by our media specialist, Guy Dalby Thomas, to help set the tone. Wow, seeing all those beautiful objects really helps transport me to the museum. And now to tell us a little more about the exhibition and the process that guided us, I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, and you can look up into the bar as I'm talking uh, and, and see their faces, but of course they'll get to introduce themselves in just a moment. So uh, I wanna start with Jim Rock who advised on the exhibit. Jim Rock is a Dakota educator. Oh, he's waving. <laughs> Uh, who decolonizes science using a traveling 30 by 15 foot uh, star dome to indigenize and digitize the skies for indigenous community collaborative outreach and storytelling settings. Jim has taught chemistry, physics, and astronomy for 40 years at reservation, urban, and suburban high schools, colleges, tribal colleges, and universities. He teaches a university honors course called Native Sky Watchers, Indigenous Ethno and Archaeoastronomy at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Jim also serves as its indigenous, uh, as its director of indigenous programming for the Planetarium Physics and Astronomy Department of Swenson College of Science and Engineering. In 2011, Jim collaborated with Native students from the American Indian OIC High School and the Dream of Wild Health Native Youth Gardening Project to design the first Native American experiment aboard STS-135 Atlantis, the last NASA space shuttle. Welcome, Jim. <laughs> and our host today is Ed Fleming. Dr. Ed Fleming is curator and director of the anthropology department at the Science Museum of Minnesota. His primary research focuses on the archaeology of North America, particularly the upper Midwest during the centuries leading up to European contact. Dr. Fleming has been involved in archaeological research projects in Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota, Montana, Ireland, and Belize. As curator, Dr. Fleming is responsible for building, caring for, researching, and interpreting the museum's cultural collections. In addition, he has been a significant significant con contributor to SMM developed ex exhibitions such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, Words That Change the World, Maya, Hidden Worlds Revealed, and of course, We Move and We Stay. Welcome, Ed. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, 
It's really, uh, it's, it's great to, to sort of see you all. Um, and thank you for attending this. Um, it's, uh, it's really been a privilege to have been involved in this project. And uh, I'm really pleased to, to share um, a little background to the project with you all, and then some highlights of, of the exhibit. And then um, uh, thank you, Jim, for for joining us. Jim is a, a longtime uh, friend, colleague, and, and collaborator, um, and a longtime associate of the Science Museum. And it's really been a, uh, a privilege to work with you, Jim, on, on this project and so many other things. So if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'm gonna do some tech stuff here, get my screen shared so you can see some slides. Let's see. Mm. All right, this is I apologize, folks. You know, we ran through this before we started and it worked out just fine, but. Hmm. Hey, Aaliyah, do you have yeah. access to the slideshow? Do you want me to run it instead? Yeah, why don't. <laughs> I'm on it. I'll let you run it, and then oh, I'll just technology. Like, so yeah, yeah I'm uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Just a moment, everyone. Yanni Washte, Mitaki Api. That's uh, good morning, my relatives. You know, uh, Dr. Fleming and myself probably do this six to ten hours a day, and I would say ninety percent of the time it works. And uh, when it's most important, uh, thanking all of you for being here, of course, that's, <laughs> that's when the technology says something different. <laughs> oh, technology. <laughs> I think. <laughs> there we go. All right. So, so thank you. Let me know when you want the next slide. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll let you know when to advance. So, um, and thank you. And I apologize for that little hiccup. Um, but we'll get through this. And, and the way that we envision this, this tour to, to go is um, kind of informal, really, and conversational between um, Jim and I. And, and hopefully it, it offers some insight into how this exhibit came to be and, um, and, and what it really represents and, and why we feel it's an important exhibit. But first, a little bit about actually what this exhibit is. We move and we stay. It's it's really an, a, it's a, a celebration of indigenous cultures, art and perspectives um, in Minnesota. The exhibit uh, draws on the Science Museum's cultural collections, um, as well as purchases of new artworks, um, contemporary artworks from uh, native artists in the region. We Move and We Stay features a, a, a beautiful and deeply meaningful array of objects and activities that were chosen by um, you know, by, by Jim and other advisors, um, uh, really meant to be engaging, thought-provoking, inspiring. Um, and then I would say that the, the, the major themes in the exhibit examine indigenous resilience and innovation across art and traditions. Um, and the objects reflect deep time connections to Minnesota, to the land, to the landscape, um, to the starscape. Uh, that's shared by many indigenous cultures in, in the region. Uh, we relied on a lot of generous collaborations and help um, from a long list of cultural advisors to create this exhibit. Uh, and We Move and We Stay really ultimately explores the, the meaning, the history, the experience um, of being indigenous in Minnesota told uh, by, by the, vo the voices of indigenous people from the area. So once again, Jim, um, thanks a lot for joining us on this call. Um, and uh, Aaliyah, can you flip to the next slide? Thank you. So the exhibit starts off with a case of three objects. And those three objects, um, they're really unified and they, they tell uh, kind of the, the, 
the story of the major theme of, of the exhibit. And Jim, I'll, I'll throw to you because Jim was really um, deeply involved in the conception of the exhibit and the creation of the, the name of the exhibit. Oh, Mitake Epi, Unki Hadakapi, Ka Uwanji Ankapi, Imbaba Madisimin, Imbaba Madisimin, Unki Hadakapi, Ka Uwanji Ankapi. Can you hear the two languages? We're saying the same thing. Uh, Dakota is the, the language of Minnesota Makoche, right here, uh, the land where the water reflects the skies. Um, we believe we have always been here. The elders tell me that we come, we come from a star or we come from a cave. Uh, and in fact, they're both true. And um, so the idea that we're, we're always from here <clears throat> and yet we can move and stay, uh, it might seem paradoxical, but in our worldview, it's, it's not binary. It's not either or, but both and. And so as we work together to choose uh, these beautiful living, uh, we hardly think of them as objects. There are relatives. They, they are imbued with living spirit. Um, so we have, for example, a saddle and uh, a cradle board and uh, this beautiful uh, bag here. So I'd like you to think about what do these three objects, how do they say we move and we stay? What connections might come to your mind, heart? eyes. Leo's flip to the next slide. So we won't be reading you a lot of words, but I will read this one to you. In this exhibit, you'll find evidence of a mobile lifestyle, seasonal tools, a saddle, cradle board, or a borrowed design. But there are also patterns that reveal a deep relationship with this place like star designs on a pot or winding plants on a beaded bag. Some elements move with the body or spirit like the jingles on a dress, the fringe on a shirt or altar cloth or smoke that carries prayers to the spirit world and old traditions inform new innovations. So uh, basically we, we saw that saddle. What does the saddle help you do? Stay on the horse. What is the horse doing? moving you. So is that saddle about moving or staying? And the answer is yes. <laughs> how about the cradle board now? Can you think of an answer for how, how that is moving and staying? You have this precious grandchild or, or child, Takoja, uh, Wakaheja. We mean the spirit being, the one who has come in. And in our way, those, those newborns are like elders, they're ancestors. They come freshly uh, carrying all that is important and good about life. So you want to really protect that, that young one in the cradle board. So that's going to stay on the mother, just as we stay on the mother earth. And yet the mother can move about. Well, guess what? Our earth mother, she's moving about uh, once a year, every winter circling the sun. So you start thinking the way we do. Next slide, Aaliyah. So I'm going to go into a little bit about how this exhibit came to be because I think it's it's significant in really understanding um, exhibits, uh, this particular exhibit, as well as um, I think how cultural exhibits are more and more being being developed these days. Um, and so flip to the next side, please, Leo. You see the, the Legacy Amendment logo down in the lower left. This uh, exhibit was funded through funds from the Legacy uh, Amendment. Uh, and the, the, first, the first year of funding, we were allowed, uh, we were, the funding enabled us to um, purchase the Bishop Whipple collection, which is a, a significant collection from the mid 1800s that was, most of the objects were, were given to um, Bishop Henry Whipple, who was the first Episcopalian Bishop of Minnesota. And so along with, with um, and that, that collection had been on long-term loan to the museum since the late 1970s, and we were able to actually um, formally add it to our collections and um, continue to be good stewards of, of these objects. 
Um, but we also wanted to have, uh, it, it presented an opportunity to exhibit some of these objects. And so, um, uh, so that was really the stimulus for this, this exhibit. Um, but I wanna start with this panel, and this is the last panel you actually see in the exhibit, but it's one of the um, most important panels, I think, in the exhibit. And that, and that is the list of, um, of the advisors who um, shared stories, contributed experiences, helped shape and guide this exhibit into being the, um, you know, the final experience that, that you witness when you go through it today. Um, the exhibit was really co-created. Thanks, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Alia. Um, the exhibit was really co-created with a, a large number of um, Indigenous people, uh, and not to mention the, you know, a long list of internal SMM staff, of course. But um, so we worked on with a, a number of advisors, including Jim uh, and others who helped us craft the copy um, for the exhibit labels, who reviewed copy um, and gave us uh, good critical feedback. Uh, we really attempted to erase the science museum's curatorial voice in favor of, um, of native voices. And then here is some, some images of just some of the artists that we worked with who contributed objects to the exhibit. Um, and we were able to use some of the, the exhibit funding to um, commission and purchase uh, uh, 21st century artworks um, by some of these artists. Um, to show in the exhibit to, uh, and which are, are being added to our permanent collection. Um, and that really demonstrate this, uh, the, the, the reality of um, cultural resilience and innovation and kind of the compression of past, present and future um, that's shown through, through some of these objects. Uh, next slide. And oh, and um, we have community curated cases too, where uh, artists and community members were uh, generously provided objects of their own to um, put into into the exhibit to discuss um, various things that are important to them. And some of the objects in this case, for example, include um, a pair of uh, beaded moccasins that were made by Ramona Stately for one of her children, um, spear fishing gear. Uh, provided by Jason Bissonette from Le Couture. Um, and uh, the beaded pipe bag that you see in this, in this image is actually from our collection. And another approach that another one of our advisors took, Ethan Nerdahl, was to um, go through our collections down in the collections vault and um, spend some time with the objects and select an object that uh, was profound and meaningful for him. And then he shared his, his story. Um, along with that object. Um, next slide, Elia. And then uh, also after we had gotten the exhibit completed and everything was installed and, and the installation process for this exhibit was, was different than most of our, um, our, our development processes. But once it was all completed, we asked some of our advisors and, and the artists to tour the exhibit and then provide critical feedback. Um, and, and let us know where we, where we succeeded and where we could have maybe done better. And then we posted some of those um, comments on the, on the exhibit cases. Next slide. Um, the exhibit is trilingual. So it's, it's written in English and Dakota and Ojibwe, at least the object names. Um, and on the intro panel, so on the right-hand side, um, you can hear the language also. And there's, there's a lot of audio in this exhibit, whether it's through interactives um, where you can push a button and hear the words spoken um, or music um, or jingles or, or video. Um, it's really a multi-sensory experience. Next slide. Um, and this, this slide addresses some of the aspects of how this exhibit came to be. So it started out as a couple cases along the wall and um, in the left hand side, you see one of the early, this is actually, I think the second version of the exhibit where it's, it's really a couple of cases. And we tried out different themes and concepts and um, ways of, of displaying things. Uh, and in the center of that exhibit, I just wanted to make a shout out. That's Scott Schumacher, um, who was one of the, the early curators on this exhibit. He's since um, taken a job at the Idle York Museum in Indiana, but um, he was a, a great collaborator as well. And then on the right-hand side, 
sorry, go back. On the right-hand side, you see uh, one of our conservators working in the visible lab. In the gallery that the exhibit is, is situated in, there is a visible lab where we can um, offer uh, in-person programming. And we use that space for uh, one of our conservators to work in that lab and actually mount the exhibit, create the exhibit mounts, do all the conservation work right uh, in that lab in front of the public and um, could solicit feedback from the public, but also just uh, offer some um, you know, information about how we create exhibits and what these, what these objects are. And so you can see um, this, uh, this vest, it's a Dakota vest with quill work on it and in the, in the lab on the top photo, and then you see it on exhibit in a case um, that, that shows a lot of floral patterns, um, the, the finished product. Okay, next slide. And then um, we spent a lot of time working on creating meaningful adjacencies between different exhibit components. And by that, I mean, when you enter an area of the exhibit, you're offered a lot of opportunities. The exhibit is not linear either. You can um, move through it as, as you wish and, and not miss any content. Um, but the exhibit is full of, of course, beautiful objects. And that's, these objects are the, the highlight of the exhibit, but also um, hands-on interactive experiences where you can um, engage all of your senses. Uh, and then a lot of meaningful um, uh, video interactives too, where um, that, that range from, you know, just videos that you can watch somebody talking about um, the objects on display or the objects being made in some cases to video interactives that offer some different choices. Um, and then lastly, no, go ahead. Yep, thank you. And then, then the, last, the last piece that I wanna say about um, some of the thinking that went into creating this exhibit uh, is that we, are, we constantly juxtapose past and present to demonstrate this, this idea of resilience and innovation over time. And these juxtapositions are through historic and, and modern photographs, through historic and modern objects and historic and modern perspectives. Okay, go ahead. So now I, we're gonna move into some exhibit highlights. Um, and uh, so you could flip to the next slide. And here, the first thing that you see when you enter the exhibit, what really I think draws you into the exhibit um, before you even see the, the intro case that, that Jim described um, is this, this bison. Um, and, and not just a, a mount of a, a bison, but, um, but shifting artworks that are projected on the wall behind it, which changes the exhibit as you're in the, the look and the feel of the exhibit as you go through it. But this bison, and um, Jim, I'm sure you'll have a lot to talk about the bison, but just a little bit about this context first. Um, of course, there, there, there used to be millions of bison on the plains, millions and millions. Um, and the range of the bison came into Minnesota and at different times over, over the past thousands of years, um, the range of the bison even crossed the St. Croix and went into Wisconsin. Um, and so there were millions and millions of bison, but the bison are of course more than just a, a subsistence object um, to people who are living with them. Um, but this particular bison, just to demonstrate the range of the bison, of course there's no wild bison in the Twin Cities, but this specimen was, um, was recovered from St. Paul, just north of St. Paul, where I-35E is right now, um, back in the early 1950s. And this is an extinct form of bison, it's bison occidentalis. So, um, and it dates to uh, six to 8,000 years old. Flip to the next slide. Um, and then also this, this um, juxtaposition of, of old and new. We, we do have a number of archaeological pieces in, in, the, collect, or in the, the exhibit collection to demonstrate this time depth, um, this deep connection to Minnesota that Indigenous people have that go back 10,000 years. So um, in the upper left is a, um, a, a point that's about um, 9,000 years old, found in southwestern Minnesota. We have some copper tools. Um, copper was mined in Lake Superior area and then traded throughout the, uh, the well, across North America, frankly, 
And the bottom image is uh, some obsidian pieces from a, um, a site near Red Wing. And obsidian was, was obtained or traded for um, as far away as Yellowstone Park, um, Western Wyoming. And then the large picture shows a, um, uh, a cache of agricultural tools that include bison bone that were used as, um, uh, as hoes um, from a cache that was excavated in also in the Red Wing area. Um, Aliyah, can you flip back to that first slide and um, the previous slide? I want I want uh, to offer Jim some some time to speak. Wana dead unyakumpi. Wana dead unyakumpi. That says we are still here now. We are here now. Dead unyakumpi. Um, we don't see these buffalo eating on the prairie, uh, rolling in the in the beautiful soil, and um, but my great grandfather did. My great grandfather told me what that was like to still see them on those prairies with the prairie grass and the wind blowing, and um, how they interacted with this relative. This is our direct relative. We are the Buffalo people. Not all of the Turtle Islanders, we could say Indians, but we refer to North America as Turtle Island. Florida and Baja California are the two legs uh, of the turtle shell. So we're up on the, the, the kind of top center of the turtle shell uh, with the water, the rivers, and of course the water is always moving. And yet we, we pray that the water will continued to stay with us in these wetlands and, and rivers and lakes. And since the big ice uh, 12,000 years ago, the glaciers that moved in here and then stayed for many, many, many winters, in which case we went a little further south, but then the glaciers move, <laughs> they retreat, then we come back. And so our stories tell us about that. And in fact, my dad's name, do not stand in front of the black buffalo. <laughs> Actually, we say things reverse of uh, English. He said, uh, buffalo black stand in front of, not. Uh, so this relative, um, as Ed said, is the, the bison occidentalis. There's even older ones, the bison antiquus, even larger. And there were 60 million of them. Imagine, uh, I mean, that's from Alaska, Canada, all the way down to parts of Mexico. <clears throat> and we lived because of this one. So uh, behind me on my little picture, you see the stars. And um, the stars include, there's a thunderbird and there's a turtle and a salamander. And there's a red circle near the bottom here. And in that red circle is a buffalo. I know it doesn't look like the buffalo, but that is our people. We, when we say we come from a star, it's uh, in the buffalo, uh, the buffalo's backbone. So these three stars in what you know as Orion um, and the two stars above and below Orion, those are the ribs. So you're looking at this now, the ribs and the backbone, the three are the highest hump the hump uh, vertebrae there. And so that also reflects to a cave. And the cave is just near the Science Museum, Wakantipi Cave. And so the river, Mississippi River there, we say the Hahawakba, um, is the Milky Way. So the star by the Milky Way above matches the cave by the river here below. And so it's a mirror. and um, when we say Mini Soto Makoche, that's the place where the water, Mini, reflects the sky. And so that's why we wanted this bison and the canoe. The canoe carries us. So we again stay in the canoe, but the canoe is moving. And we're moving through time as well as place as our ancestors did. Um, and that river is a cosmic river of stars that reflect the light. 
but also the water down below that reflects the sunlight, the sparkles. So the, uh, this buffalo has a red pouch in its uh, front because we always offer that red is that sacred color. It's like blood color. It's the color of our tobacco, the chanshasha, the red osier dogwood. And there is some of that tobacco in there. Tobacco is the plant that we uh, communicate with. It's like our cell phone uh, to all the relatives um, and uh, those who are seen and unseen. And in fact, we're thanking this one that they could be here for millions of years uh, before us and um, giving us life every day. So to us, this one is still with us. We're still here. Um, and, and we ask its permission really that, that you know, um, I'm not sure I want my bones on display. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, next slide, Leah. Keeping with the, the star theme, um, here's a cluster of objects that includes a, a star quilt that was given to the museum by Timia Owen, who wove it after um, one year after her father uh, in law, I believe, passed away um, during what's called the, the wiping of the tears ceremony. Jim, um, can you talk a little bit about star quilts and and, sure. and Venus and yeah, those ideas? We, uh, the star quilt has eight points, and um, you know we also had the buffalo robes before this. That's another item here, but um, our symbol for a star. Actually, we have several different kinds of star symbols. And, uh, but generally it's about that mirror. So you see the person seated here, there's a mirror because when you put the little uh, four-sided uh, parallelograms, they reflect. Well, so does water reflect. And so what's above in the spirit world, the sky and the stars is reflected here in the, the physical, the material world, the world we can touch and have a body in. And so the breath and our spirit and soul goes above and then we're, you know, we're breathing in, breathing out. So from the very first breath that we're born, we like to put the little baby onto a little star quilt. And then from taking our last breath, we wrap that honored, loved relative uh, in a larger uh, star quilt. And then uh, so from birth to death, first breath to last, morning star to evening star, sunrise, sunset. You know, and there's even more there. Um, the eight points represent the eight years that Venus takes, um, roughly 2,920 days, um, eight times 365, to reappear near that same part of the sky again. Um, the other thing is Venus is visible as a morning star for about nine months. That matches the time we're in our mothers. 266 days in our mom, 263 days for Venus as a morning star, then you don't see Venus. Then it is in the West following the sun down again for 263 days or nine months. So even though it's nine months, but it's eight years and Venus does five kinds of dances. So that's why all these different geometric shapes represent those numbers. Thanks, next slide, Aaliyah. Continuing on the... Uh... I guess the, the symbolism and the, the, the star discussion, we have a couple objects. Um, these are, they're, they're near each other, but they, both of these objects, um, a Dakota shirt and um, a ceramic pot bear images of Thunderbirds. Um, the ceramic pot is about 800 years old. It dates to about 1200 um, CE and is from uh, a village in uh, the Red Wing area. And on the, the pot, there's a, a thunderer, and then also there's, there's four thunderbirds at each quadrant, and then in between are uh, images of a, a serpent or a lightning, um, which are conflated really kind of the same thing. Um, Jim? Yeah, this is, uh, this is one of the first pieces that my dad and I uh, were so drawn and attracted to and respectful of because to make a large pot like this means that the, the water, the, the medicine in that water, um, the ceremony that goes with sharing that 
with a whole community. First of all, that, that Thunderbird, we say Wakian, and uh, the lightning is uh, Wakahdi. Um, when the Thunderbird blinks its eye, the lightning comes out. When you hear the thunder and the lightning, you know, you know the rain's going to come. You, you can be afraid. Uh, it, it startles your heart. Um, I just heard, in fact, there was an earthquake in Japan as we're presenting this. Uh, I have been to that part of Japan, Fukushima, um, and uh, there was earthquake there in 1978 as well. Um, so it shakes earth and sky. And this, this one has a special shape though. One wing is curved and the other is extended. And that tells me it's matching the shape of the Thunderbird star over my shoulder. Um, it's kind of a far away view there, but in my little picture, you'll see a Thunderbird near the, uh, it's between the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. It's the constellation Draco, uh, the European dragon and a little more. So the Thunderbird's wingtip star was the North Star 5,000 years ago. And even though this pot may be 800 or so years old, it's telling us that the Thunderbird was the center of the sky. And it certainly is center stage when, when those storms come in here. And we need the water. So we're thanking and, and grateful for the water that Thunderbird brings, but we always pray and hope that it will be gentle and not with winds that wash everything away, blow everything away, you know, the tornadoes and so forth, the floods. So that water gives life. Water is the, the blood of Earth Mother. So when the water's in the sky, it's the Thunderbird that brings in and has that water in those clouds. But when the water's on the Earth, it's the snake form, the zigzag. And that, that Unktehi, that uh, horned serpent, lives in the cave where the water is in St. Paul. That's, uh, that it's able to move through the aquifers the under the earth water and the on the earth water and the rivers and lakes. So this four sided represents like, you know, the Big Dipper in four positions over the four seasons, separated by the four days, the two equinoxes, the two solstices. Why is that important? Because I couldn't tell you this if the snow wasn't on the ground and now we're in uh, February in the deep cold time because the thunders are sleeping the snakes are sleeping, the bears are sleeping. That's very important. So even though we're recording this, uh, we will not use this recording. And if it's, uh, we don't wanna talk about these ones when they're not sleeping um, because they might get you. <laughs> Great, next slide, Leah. Um, continued discussions of, of connections to the, the landscape and, and and um, well, the starscape, and now more more directly to the landscape, we have several cases um, that that really uh, illustrate seasonal connections. So Jim was talking about the the seasons from the perspective of uh, of the stars. Um, how does that translate on the ground? We have um, a full case of objects that uh, represent different seasons and then a case that uh, the one on the left that changes out with every season. We have a different collection of objects that we, we put in and, and what's currently in there um, is we're still on wild racing because of course the museum's closed, um, but we'll be getting that changed out um, sometime soon. So uh, we'll be putting the spring material in in time for um, all of you folks to come back to the museum later this month or in the spring. And then um, this is uh, this is a, a work of art created by um, Pat and his son Gage Cruz. Um, it's a big birch bark panel, uh, and it's called uh, All Seasons Bouquet. Um, and what you see here is it's entirely made out of birch bark, and you see all of the the different colors of the birch bark represent um, different uh, different times of the year and different ages of the tree. Uh, when the bark was actually harvested. Um, and try this word as well, uh, the word Chang, Chang. Now, you know, the city of Chanhassen, well, Chanhassen. Chang is tree. And try the word Ha. Ha is skin. So what's Chang Ha? 
tree skin, bark. We have skin, the tree has skin. The tree also, you know, has the blood. That's the sap, that's the sugar. And when you do the maple uh, sap boiling, you know, that's when the tree's blood becomes your blood on those pancakes. <laughs> and um, so we share breath. So uh, yes, the next slide is the word wakang. Wakang, and that N is a nasal. Uh, and kind of like a back of the throat, like the word sing, wakang. That word is, uh, has been translated, of course, this was Bishop Whipple. And as our people, uh, you know, recognize that he stood up for us. He saw the injustice and the inequity in what was happening. He saw that the treaties, uh, what we were supposed to be receiving in the lands didn't come. Um, and the mistreatment and that uh, the monies went elsewhere. And yet in that Bible, he says, there's this word holy. So what's the word for our word holy? Well, he says, it's, we, we said it's Wakang, but Wakang is, uh, so this is holy, 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 as it would be read. And so, but it's really also creation and destruction. Uh, remember the Thunderbird is Wak, Wakiang, Wakiang versus Wakang. Kiang means flying. So it's the one that can, remind us of the creation power, like that lightning, uh, but also it, it comes with, you know, life comes with death attached. That's just how it is in childbirth or, you know, um, so, so the four direction symbol, the cross of course has one direction longer, but you see how it's a bridge. And so what is moving and what is staying in this case? Uh, we pray the spirit will always be here with us, but it's always moving. And so when two different ways of seeing the universe come together, sometimes we can, we can share the same canoe and other times we need to be in our own canoes. And that's a challenge. And uh, so I respect that Bishop Whipple respected our way. Uh, and so our elders honored him or they wouldn't have made uh, these beautiful altar cloths and, and bags and gifts. Great, next slide. Um, and then this is also, uh, this is Jim Denneby, the painting um, that refers to, that's of course Lincoln and with the noose, your eye is drawn there. And you also see Uncle Sam, but you see a modern Minneapolis police department car because unfortunately on the days of, uh, not that long ago when my dad was walking on Franklin and, and of course with the events of George Floyd this summer and so forth, this, this uh, is a story of, unfortunately, um, it has not been democracy as the male founders um, might have envisioned. I'm, I'm not sure they did. We were kind of uh, just in the way. And so this painting, if you study it carefully, uh, Jim Denemy is a wonderful uh, Ojibwe painter. It, it shows um, the events of 1862 when the treaties weren't honored and our grandmothers were starving and it was the Dakota War. Now, just yesterday, um, about a hundred acres were finally returned back by the Historical Society of Minnesota to the, the Lower Sioux, the Chanchayapi folks. And uh, <clears throat> so, these these ongoing um, injustices, and hopefully uh, we can we can be building bridges again. But it's going to be a difficult challenge. Um, there's so many aspects, details, the stories, the chickens, the the grass. Won't have time to go into it. <laughs> Great. Next, and here's a a, cup, a cluster of uh, components. One is um, focuses. Uh, native flutes um, and the, the native flute tradition, which uh, almost almost disappeared in, in the Midwest. Um, but there was a, a Dakota man, Mike Oker, who was associated with the, the Science Museum back in the 70s. Um, he was a flute maker and he made, made flutes, which he then um, added to our collection. And then um, another flute, uh, actually a, a, a teenage Ojibwe boy, sought him out to learn how to create flutes, Jeffrey Chapman. Um, and he learned to be really a master flute maker. Um, and he also carved flutes and um, added them into the collection. So this, the, the flute story here with, with these making of flutes really is, uh, is one of um, continuing traditions and, and 
the importance of teaching these traditions and passing them along. The flute music that you heard at the beginning at the top of this presentation um, was uh, Jeffrey Chapman playing one of the flutes from, from the collection. And so also the, there was, you know, beadwork, but before the beadwork, we had the porcupine quills and the quill work. My wife still does that. And um, it's a lot of work and it's uh, painful and it, to dye the quills and to keep that color vibrant and it, it but it's so amazing. And, um, but you, you just, uh, you realize that uh, the price to be paid, uh, these beautiful colors uh, and finally, yeah, the drum is that the drum is the heart, the chantrega. Next slide. The Next chantrega, slide. chang is wood or tree. We said chaha, but there's wood in the circle of the drum. It's the tree. And we send a voice, uh, a good voice singing together, many voices as relatives around one heartbeat. That is the heartbeat of Earth Mother. And we sing together and we're, we're praying, we're thanking uh, the creation for our, and the creator of the creation for that life. And so as we breathe in and out and we're singing um, the words in our breath, we just wanna keep that heartbeat alive, keep that heart beating. So you think of the lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Our word for heart is chante. The drum is chanchega. The tree is chang, and we put tobacco on that drum, chandi or chanshasha. And in the middle of the word for star, we chanchbi. So with all those chang words, uh, I say, michante etan wopida tanka, thank you from my heart. Thank you, Jim. And um, with that, I think we'll, we'll end there. That last image was uh, in the exhibit when one of our advisors brought his his class to the exhibit. And um, really our, our intent was to create a, um, an engaging place of community and gathering and inspiration. And um, I hope you guys, uh, if you're able to come to the museum and um, tour this exhibit that you'll, you'll also see it in that way. Um, so we'll end there. And I, I just wanna say thank you for attending and um, Thank you for your membership and your support of the museum. Um, and and we, we all look forward to seeing you actually at the museum uh, in the, the coming weeks and months. Um, I think we have time for some questions, right, Aaliyah? Yeah, in, indeed. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much, Ed and Jim, for joining us and uh, for your wonderful presentation. I learned so much about that beautiful exhibit and I can't wait to see all of you back at the museum. Uh, we do have a little time for Q&A, uh, so I'll remind everyone you can use the chat window at the bottom of your screen to chat any questions that you have. Uh, and to, and uh, just, just to start things off, uh, I wanted to start with a question for Jim, um, because I know you've been involved in the museum for a really long time uh, as an advisor and as a friend to our community. So can you tell us a little bit more about the, your involvement with the museum beyond advising on we move in and stay? Oh, sure. Just briefly, uh, speaking of moving and staying, you know, our museum moved. <laughs> and I remember when it was up there uh, at the other facility. And um, in fact, there was a security guard there who was a friend of my, our families, my dad's. And it was like that movie, Night at the Museum. And so uh, I got to hang out with him, you know, uh, uh, end of high school and uh, college. Uh, and, and, you know, basically we'd keep each other awake, but we'd also walk the halls with the flashlights and make sure, you know, that the dinosaur bones were just fine. And just like that museum story, you know, I, I realized, wow, if these bones could talk. And I realized, yeah, they do, because our elders talk about when those old giant relatives were living. And so the bison bones, I, I guess you see the idea. And, and uh, you know, Ed uh, and I have met through many other uh, events. Basically summer of 92 was when I officially became, uh, I was teaching there at the Science Museum with people like Jim Northrup and Johnny Smith, two of our Ojibwe elders who have gone back to the stars now. And, uh, 
I, I still can't believe. I mean, I feel like I'm still in my 20s or 30s, but it's, it's, uh, I'm in my 60s and <laughs> the winter gray hair is here. Snow. <clears throat> That's great. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, I don't see any questions coming into the chat. So maybe you both just did such a great job uh, sharing and relating your experiences with this exhibit that everybody's just still processing that content, which is also just fine and, and great. So I, I want to thank you again, Jim and Ed, so much for your participation. Uh, oh, look at that. I do see a question now coming in from um, Marin. And she asked, or she or he or they right. ask, uh, are there other Native American museums around the cities that you recommend? That's a great question. Jim, maybe we can start with you. Well, uh, I don't want to leave any out, but you might be surprised to know that even now, and it is open, uh, but it's a small facility. So wear your masks and you know space appropriately. Is the Russian um, Museum of of um, Art <laughs> uh, over by Highway 35 South, Minneapolis? Um, one of our Dakota mm -hmm. and and uh, she's other Indigenous Nation artists, Marlena Miles. She animated a video that I do uh, to explain our, our cave site through the Minnesota Humanities Commission. But Marlena has amazing um, artwork right now in the Russian Museum. You might think, well, why, why would Indigenous artists be there? Well, when you think about um, Alaska in particular, you know, uh, it was just 1867, five years after we were exiled from Minnesota. Uh, we didn't go that far, but those Indigenous relatives up in a, what is now considered Alaska, uh, the Russians, and, and the Danish and the, you know, all the colonizing mixed uh, Euro heritage. Uh, so that, but we've of course got the, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, the um, Minnesota Historical Society. Um, I, I wish I could say that more of our uh, Dakota reservations, although we're only 1% of 1% of the original all of Minnesota, but there are some display cases and artifacts and we don't have uh, museums per se at those uh, those reservation. Sometimes there's community centers, there's good, you know. So um, sometimes now with digital aspects, you can uh, find uh, online also. Um, we have some stories now, the YouTube. Uh, the, my wife uh, is also a professor teaching at UMD and she teaches about our our indigenous histories, she's Ojibwe and Odawa, but she's found many accurate resources. Um, you do need to be careful when you're looking online to make sure that they are indigenous uh, artists and, and interpreters, uh, speakers, you know, um, so you're not believing sort of the, uh, yeah, the, the Disney Pocahontas version. Uh, she uses that example too. A lot has improved since uh, I was a boy. <laughs> So Ed, you, you've got many, I'm sure, and the National Museum of American Indian out in DC, if you get out that way, for sure, yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful museum. Um, locally, I would, I would point to, um, beyond this, our exhibit, um, I would point to the History Center has a um, sort of a similar exhibit. In fact, their curators came down and toured We Move and We Stay for inspiration for the exhibit that they created, but it, it's a, um, it's also an exhibit um, that focuses on indigeneity in, in Minnesota. And then um, as far as tribal museums, um, uh, Shakopee Midwakanton community has a brand new community center with a wonderful exhibit um, in it that I would encourage everybody to, to go check out. And it's, um, it also, there's a lot of great objects um, from regional collections and also loans from the Smithsonian. Um, and a number of, of great interactives as well. Yeah, and, thank you, Ed, specifically for helping me complete my thought. That was in my, the picture was there, but I, and if you get about a hundred miles north of the cities, of course, Milak has, uh, you know, Ojibwe Museum up there. Now, Milak is, of course, French for uh, one of a thousand lakes, but we called, before it was French, that's in Dakota, was Badewakan, again, the holy creation lake um, and that's where Shakpe had had villages we have mounds and earth lodges up there 
um, Shakpe, meaning six. So, you know, son of Shakpe was Shakpe Dan, little six. So, you know, this whole region is, is Dakota with, um, you know, yeah, we now, sh you know, share with Ojibwe folks. And so yeah, that's why I love this exhibit. It shows that we, we can live together. And it's not just as the history books say that divide and conquer, we, we just never could get along. No, that's not the case. I think that's a great sentiment to end on. So uh, Jim and, and Ed, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your experiences with the exhibit uh, and when, with museums and the Metro uh, in general. I wanna thank all of you who are on the call uh, for being members. And we're so grateful for your commitment to bold science, fun and lifelong learning. And we appreciate your continued support. You can check out all the events that we're offering this month as part of our member appreciation month at smm.org backslash thanks. And I have to mention uh, that uh, we are doing another uh, event uh, with Ed later this month on the 25th. We're doing a coffee with a curator event. So if you enjoyed that flute uh, music that you heard at the top of the program, you can meet Jeff Chapman, the performer, uh, later this month for that event. So please do join us for that and all of our member appreciation month events. Uh, thank you so very much for your support. Have a great morning.